All right, so if you have your Bibles, take, uh, take them out, turn to Colossians chapter 3. That's where we're going to be this morning, and honestly, that's where we're camping out um, for the whole day uh, today. Um, I, I, figured, I figured we have until about it snows, so I think the snow's going to drop at about 3, and then we'll just dismiss it that, about that point, okay? Um, but Colossians chapter 3, we left off last week at verse 17, so I'm going to pick up in verse 18. Uh, that's all right. We're going to go back and read 17 in just, a, in just a few moments, but I want to start in verse 18. It says, Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, verse 22, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Chapter 4, verse 1 says this, Masters, Treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, I want us to spend some time with this, and here's some things that I think you need to avoid for the next few minutes as we, as we talk about this, okay? Avoid elbowing, okay? Avoid looking across the aisle or next to you judgmentally, Okay? Avoid looking up at the pulpit <laughs> judgmentally. You can look at me, just not judgmentally. And I will not look at you, therefore, judgmentally. I've thought about many of you as... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't remember when we decided to preach Colossians. I think it was sometime last summer. But whenever we decide to, to preach through a book of the Bible, I take time and read through that book of the Bible a couple of times. And each time I read through Colossians, the, these verses jumped out at me, right? Because, because these, are, these are the ones where, where you know, pastors, uh, when they're planning a vacation, they, they try to look at, at the text and say, ooh, that one, I'll miss that one, right? Um, but I'm here, lucky me, uh, to preach on this, this topic. And, and here's the deal. It's, it's not a topic. It's actually the text. And, and what we're going to see in just a minute, that, that, that what, you, what you need to remember is when Paul wrote these things, he didn't, he didn't section them out in chapters and verses. And so we're going to look at that a little, a little bit because this, this passage of Scripture, if we, just, if we just parachute in to verse 18 and start with wives, submit to your husbands, we get a completely different context than we do if we look at where Paul has been and look at where he's going. Okay, Paul who wrote this letter to the church at Colossae. But as I was really diving into this, this, this past week, and, and here's something you need to hear as well. There is so much, there is so much information that I want to give you around this. Because I feel like the words that we've just read from, from wives and husbands to parents and children to masters and slaves, right? These are like fireworks today in 2024, right? They're fireworks. And, 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 and people come with all kinds of background and information and teaching and legalistic thoughts and, 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 and you can't own me or you can't tell me what to do or you know Paul has just gone off the rails here with his writing. There are so many people that have such a disrespect for, for Paul and his writings because he wrote things like this. And in 2024, we struggle with the idea of authority. We struggle with the idea of order. We struggle with the idea of masters and slaves and different things like that. Some of the, some of the big and language that he uses here, as the kids say, triggers us. Tweaks us. And so here's what I need you to do this morning. Before we get started, 
Because we're going to unpack this and we're going to go back. If you look at verse 17 of chapter 3, we ended with it last week. Now, let me remind you, because if you weren't here, there were ladders set up. And we've done this twice now, right? Where where one ladder represented the old self, one ladder represented the new self. And we talked about how we've got to stop trying to balance our lives between both ladders. We've We've got to choose which self we're going to clothe ourselves in. Old self or new self. And so Paul is obviously trying to stir the affections of the church at Colossae's hearts for Jesus and come to the new self. Put, remember the gospel. Remember what Jesus did for you. Remember these things. Do this. Choose the new self. Put on the new self. And here's the implications for that. And then he closes in verse 17. He says, and whatever you do, and whatever you do, in word or deed, Do all to the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. And then Paul, like a good preacher, gives three illustrations for what that would look like. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all to the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. And so we can't just parachute into this because what Paul is doing is is he's saying, if you're a wife... Do it with all of your heart, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. If you're a husband, love fiercely with everything that you have in you. Excuse me, I want to go over there. They're having some fun, right? If you're a husband, love fiercely. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the Lord Jesus. And, and, don't, and don't respond circumstantially to the, to the counterpart in front of you because you're not, you're not husbanding for them. You're not wiving for them. You're doing it as a steward to the Lord. As unto Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. And so when they don't deserve your honor, when they, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. It's not for them. If you're a child, obey completely. Follow mom and dad fully as unto the Lord. If you're a parent, steward well as unto the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. If you have, now, now, now let, me, let, me, let me spoiler alert, okay? The word, in, the word Paul uses is slave, okay? If you're under authority in a workplace in any way, right? If you're under authority governmental in any way, if you've ever seen a police officer on the side of the road and you slammed on your brakes, this is you. And we have to remember that in, in Scripture, and we need to remember this, right? It's 2024, okay? God says in Scripture, between the leather, between the covers, that all authority, look at your neighbor and say all. All means everybody, everything, right? All authority is placed there by whom? God. And so he's saying, if you're under authority in any way, do it as unto the Lord, giving thanks. That stung a little. To God the Father by him. Because I, I, I'll be honest, right? I, I don't, I'm always looking for the gray area. Anybody else? Sir, you can't stand there makes me just want to stand there all the more, right? And then masters, if you're a boss, if you're in leadership, if you're in authority, Paul says, because you've got to understand, culturally, these were normal words. Culturally, this is how they talk. Culturally, today in 2024, we've made some of these words really bad. We get to that in just a second, okay? But if you're in leadership, if you're a, if you're in authority in any way, do it as unto Christ, giving thanks to God the Father 
by Him. Giving thanks to God the Father by Him. And so if we just, again, parachute into these verses, we miss the heart of Paul. That he's saying, and whatever you do, husband, wife, parent, child, boss, worker, do all to the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. So here's what I need to ask you to do. Here's what I need to ask you to do this morning. I want you to take, and, and some of you may be saying, hey, you know, Pastor, just, just preach. It's okay. You're going to be okay. You're not going to get fired because of this message. Well, you're one, and there's a lot more than you. And so I appreciate that sentiment. But it's okay. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take everything that you've thought, heard, listened to, read about when it comes to any one of these categories. Because we all carry a backpack around, don't we? Some of you may be wondering, oh, there it is. (laughs) That's why he's wearing the backpack. Some of you have been really concerned for my mental health. They were like, I know he said he was only in Nashville for two days, but it looks like some other things wore off on him quickly. We all have a backpack of baggage that we carry when it comes to these things. Women in ministry, women in submission, husbands don't be, you know, husbands love your wife. We all have, we all have this backpack. And and, and what, I want to, what I want to ask you to do is for the next 30 minutes, take the backpack off. Take the backpack off. I'm getting to that part. There's one in every congregation. Thanks for not being that one. Take the backpack off of everything that you've heard about submission or thought about submission or, or, or the, hurt, the hurt that you have with how these words that we read from Paul were used to, to lessen you as a person. Take it off this morning. Take any preconceived Thoughts, feelings, emotions around being a husband, being a wife, being a child, being a parent, being a slave, being a master. All these words, don't let them distract from what God wants to do. Because some of us walk in and we hear these words and we automatically get a chip on our shoulders. We listen more intently than ever to find the place where, oh, I don't, that's, that's where I don't, that's where I disagree with pastor, right there. And what I want to ask you to do, because I want to pray for us in just a moment around this, but what I want to ask you to do is take the backpack off and just, just symbolically, I mean, in your seat, I'm not inviting you up here with me, okay, but just lay it at the altar this morning. And pray this, as I'm about to pray it for you. God, speak to me. Speak to me about who you've called me to be. Because that's Paul's heart here. Whatever you do, whatever God calls you to in your life, in word or deed, do it all as unto Christ. Giving thanks to God for the opportunity giving thanks to God for the role, giving thanks to God for the position, giving thanks to God for the authority by Christ. So Father, this morning, as we unpack your words through Paul to the church at Colossae and to the church at Summit here today, God, I pray, clear the cobwebs, Clear the clutter. Clear the hurt. That for just just a few moments we could hear from You. We could receive from You what I believe You were really trying to get through to us in this passage. 
God, help us not to use your word as a weapon in these ways against one another. Because God, it is a weapon. It's sharper than any two-edged sword to fight the enemy, to fight evil. But God, there's nothing in these verses this morning that's evil. You write them to bring clarity. You're not the author of confusion. You write write them to bring wisdom, to bring order and chaos. So help us. Help me. God, I want to speak boldly. I don't want to fear repercussion with sharing the things that I believe you've taught me in this. So be with us. We need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, two things I want us to do this morning. The first one is this. Surrender to His leadership. Okay? Surrender to His leadership. Do all to the name of the Lord Jesus. And recognize that all order, all authority is placed there by God. All of it. All of it. Paul is not just shifting gears here. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents and everything. For that pleases the Lord. He's not shifting gears here to pick on women, children, and those under authority and telling people to do better. That's not his goal, right? Uh, and, and, And again, there's much that I've studied over the last few months as I've known today's coming, but, but what, we need to, what, what we need to recognize is whatever you do in word or deed, do all as unto Christ. Because passages like this, this morning, are misunderstood, misinterpreted, they're used to, they're used to, to tear down and not build up, right? All of these, all of these different things. And what I'm tired of, and why I believe I'm so passionate about this today, is I'm tired of these words being used to cause doubt about the love of Jesus, about the authority of Scripture. My objective is to stay in between the covers of the Bible and tell you passionately what it says, I believe, about each of these categories, making people uh, dislike God, uh, used by Paul to write in, in his word for us to gain life from, right? That, 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 that words like this make people do that. And so this warning, what I want us to do is surrender to his leadership. Recognize the authority of Scripture. Can we do that? Okay, three of you said yes. Can we do that? Yes. All right, awesome. So we're going to surrender to his leadership. Number two, I want us to serve with his love. Okay, recognizing again, giving thanks to God the Father through Jesus as husbands, as wives, as children, as servants of the Lord, as those in authority, bosses, ministry leaders, elders, de- right, everyone. We must operate with love for one another as an expression, as expressions of our love for Jesus. And so Paul, Paul talks about this, and so we're going to surrender to his leadership, we're going to serve with his love, we're going to look with, with eyes Um, looking to serve in the love of Christ, recognizing God is not the author of confusion, recognizing that these are not hills, right? Because there's, there's opinions, right? There's convictions and there's absolutes, right? Absolutes are things that I would absolutely die on that hill for, okay? The resurrection of Jesus is something I would fight to the death over if we were in an argument. The virgin birth is something I would fight to the death over in an argument, okay? Southern sweet tea being in heaven is something I would fight to the death over in an argument. It's an absolute, okay? Then there's convictions. There's, there's beliefs that, 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 that really go one side or the other. They're, 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 the, reasons, they're the reasons for church splits. The reasons for, they're the reasons for so many denominations. The re- they're the reasons we have like 89 types of Baptists. Um, you know, they're, they're, right? they're the reasons we have so many, so many different uh, uh, fractions of the church of Jesus because along the way, um, people got a conviction, 
about the way they were supposed to live, about the way they were supposed to act, about the way they were supposed to worship, right? People got the conviction that they were supposed to clap and dance and shout and celebrate, right? And that, 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 that made some people uncomfortable. And so they said, you go and you have your worship service over there and we're going to stay over here and we're going to have our worship service and we're, we're not going to clap, right? We're not going to clap. And so we sent all the clappers south and we stayed up here. Right? We're not gonna clap. Okay? Right? And 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 so we take these convictions from from God. And, and here's the thing about a conviction: you can believe in a conviction, and you should believe in a conviction so hard and so firm that it makes you want to fight to the death over, but it's not worth it. Because there's so many convictions that we fight over with people that we're gonna spend eternity with in heaven. I have a conviction. I'm not joking about this, okay? But it, it's probably going to be a little funny. I have a, I have a conviction that a steak should be medium to medium rare. Okay? If you do any more than that, you lose the flavor. And so I'm convicted that I don't want, if I make you a steak, I don't want you to lose the flavor. I want you to taste the goodness. I want you to taste the goodness. And I have relatives that it takes two hours to make their steak. Because they eat it well done. And that's their conviction. I've tried to change them. But I can't. Only Jesus can. And He hasn't done that yet. Right? And so, and so it's, a, it's a choice, right, for me to surrender that conviction in the moment and say, okay, I'll make you, is this well done enough? No? Nope? Okay, another hour. Right? Right? Is this well done enough? No? Okay. It's it's solid. <laughs> right? You get the point. You get the point, right? So many of us will take these convictions, we'll heighten them up, we'll fight to the death over, and we'll wreck relationships. We'll we'll we will st- stir hurt. Right? And it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And then opinions. Oof. Mm. We'll have an opinion about something. And another way to use opinion would be preference. Right? Preference. Right? The biggest, the biggest way we see this in the church is like is is like is is is, is, is worship style, right? The song selection. Right? Preference. Opinion. Right? Well, that church went bad when they put the hymnals away and they stopped singing hymns. Preference. Opinion. Opinion. And we got to be careful about opinions and preferences. Because if we allow them to dominate us, a lot like convictions, if we choose to fight over a preference or opinion, it will do nothing but hurt. Nothing but divide. And what I find about this, what I find about this when it comes to preferences or opinions, convictions, absolutes, what I find about this so interesting, what I find about this so interesting is this. Jesus, on his way to the cross, John 17, just just bathe in that for a week if you struggle with this. Like, just bathe in it. Just let it bask over you. Because because Jesus' heart for the church that hadn't even been started yet, really, because the church didn't start until after he ascended into heaven, right? And and, 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 and Acts 2, and, and, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and all of those things. Jesus set a lot of models for the church and discipleship and the, and the Gospels that we get to read about. But in John 17, as he's praying, he says, May they be one. As you, Father, and I are one. I don't know about you, but I really don't want to be the reason that Jesus' prayer isn't answered. That I cause such division over my preferences or convictions. Now, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything goes because I've noticed I left out absolutes. Right? That I would, that I would push somebody away from Christ. Which, which, by the way, if you push somebody away from the church, you're pushing them away from Christ. Okay? Oh, they can... No, no. This is essential. 
to the life of the believer. Go back and listen to the last couple weeks if you don't believe that. Okay? This is essential to the life of the believer. What we're doing here is essential to the life of the believer. It's essential. It's essential. And I don't want to be the reason. I don't want to make my preferences, and I've got them. I've got them. I don't want my convictions. I've got them. I've got them. To rule the day so that I cause division in the body of Christ, whom he loved. I mean, notice in all of Paul's writings, love your wives. Love as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. You know how he gave himself? He died a sinner's death. Gave himself for her. That's how much Jesus loved the church. I don't want to be the reason for division there. For hurt there. Because I made much of my opinions, my preferences, my convictions more than absolutes. More than absolutes. None of that was even in the notes. But I'm glad that it was said. And so as we approach these relationships, let's look at them. The first one is wives and husbands. Hey guys, ladies, one of you, take the lead here. And just, just, uh, put that arm around, just, just give her a little squeeze. Give him a little squeeze. Hey, uh, nothing that's said in these, there you go Debbie, squeeze him. Give him a little kiss on the cheek. Yep, there you go, oh yeah. All right, right? Nothing that's going to be said here. We're not going to fight over it at lunch. We're good. Okay? Wives and husbands. Let's look back at the text. Verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord, in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, there's a couple, couple words here, right? Submit. Everybody say submit. Harsh. Everybody say harsh. Two big words. Right? Two big words. Now, here's, here's the thing. How many of you have said lately that you love a type of food? Okay, yeah. How many of you have said lately that you love Jesus? How many of you know that that word love is different, hopefully? <laughs> right? There are many different expressions for the word love. In the same way, there are many different expressions for the word submit. There are many different expressions for the word harsh, right? Harsh. I looked at a, um, I, I went through TSA a couple times over the last week, right? And here's something you need to know about me. The, the automatic thing where you go and stand, right? And it goes, right? Yeah, that, did you like that? Okay. I'm, I'm like a half an inch too tall for it half an inch too tall for. And so every time I go through TSA, it's a guessing game, right? And so the other day, I thought I would be helpful. I was trying to be helpful. I, they said, next! I walked up there, feet on the yellow things. I, y- yes, sir, I, n- I know that, right? Uh, I, this is not first time I've flown. All right, hands up, okay, right? Uh, and then I bent. <laughs> sir, I need you to stand straight up. Oh, well, I'm a little too, uh, sir, stand straight up. He was not in the mood to hear my back talking. <laughs> and it went, <laughs> came out, sir, you're a little too tall for this. We're going to have to. <laughs> Jesus loves you. I know he does. And I am trying so hard right now. <laughs> right? In my mind, in my mind, I was saying all kinds of harsh things to this man, right? Harsh, right? Because I thought he was being harsh to me. You know, I'm tall. I'm just trying to help you, man. You know, I'm just trying to get through. Starbucks is right there. I'm just trying to get to the manna, you know? You're not letting me, Right?
but he never yelled at me. But I, I felt like he was being harsh to me. Right? You, go, you know where I'm going with this? Okay. Father, mother, kid in the living room, kid runs straight for fireplace. What do you do? Stop! Right? Baby starts screaming. Why? Because you startled it. Right? And some people look at that and say, harsh. How many of you know you can't parent in Target today the same way you parented in Target 30 years ago? <laughs> was Target around 30 years ago? I don't know. I think it was. Not as many. Not up here. Okay. We started it down there. Sorry. <laughs> um, right? You can't because some people view it as harsh. There's many different iterations of the word harsh. And most of it, hear this, is how people receive harsh. Right? And so, knowing that, let's look at this. Wives and husbands. Okay? Woof, we got to go. Okay? Y'all stop distracting me. All right. Wives and husbands. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting to the Lord. Now, here's what we have to know. Here's what we have to know. When it comes to wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Headship, which is what Paul you know, is talking about here, is not dictatorship. It's not lordship. Okay? It is not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not any of those things. God's design for men and women was not that men lord over at all. It was not that men would lord over at all. Headship is, and if you're taking notes, write, write this down. This is straight from, from Scripture and, 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 and much, 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 much study. Headship is loving leadership. Headship is loving leadership. In fact, both the husband and the wife in a marriage need to be submitted to the Lord and to each other. That is essential in marriage. Both the husband and the wife need to be submitted to the Lord and to each other. It's meant to be a mutual respect under Jesus. Remember verse 17, and whatever you do, husband and wife, do all to the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. Giving thanks to God the Father by Him. That we have different roles, that we have different places. And, and here's the truth. You look at any sports team. If we asked the center on a football team, which is the guy that, for those of you that don't know, the guy that hikes the ball, the guy that touches the ball every time, hikes it to the quarterback, right? What would it look like if we had, and typically centers are like 5'7", 420, right? Like they're big. They're big, okay? Maybe a little taller, okay? Right? What does it look like if a football team looks at the center and says, we need you to be the running back? Well, they might not be able to tackle. That's actually a decent strategy. I should be a football coach. Right? But there's different roles. On a basketball team, you have a point guard. They dribble the ball. You have a center. They don't dribble the ball. Right? No one ever asked Shaquille O'Neal to dribble the ball or to shoot outside of five feet. Right? Every team sport has different roles and different positions and different places. So it is in the marriage. Right? But the mutual love and submission that is meant to drive a marriage creates an atmosphere of growth in the home that enables both to become. And here's the goal. Here's the pursuit. Remember the goal of Scripture, right? For both to become all that God wants them to be. All that God wants them to be. So fellas, you can't go home today and make me lunch. Say, make me lunch. Wives, submit. That's not the goal of this passage. But is that you are both submitted and surrendered to the Lord in each other, that you push each other, drive each other to both become all that God wants you to be. Now, and again, I believe that there's a biblical, historical, and practical reason that Paul uses this language. The term submit has been historically misunderstood in many ways. Many people accuse Paul of being a misogynist. 
Right? They can't respect Paul's writings who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, which is a really big struggle, because they just see him as a Messiah out of date, all those different things. They believe the term sanctions abuse. They use it to validate their dismissal of Scripture as being culturally confined or outdated. Others have adopted and employed the term as a license for domineering leadership. You should follow me because the Bible says so. In the home that requires obedient servitude by the wife. Both of these extreme views completely Everybody say completely. Misinterpret the meaning of the term and miss the heart of the passage. Both of them misinterpret the meaning of the term and miss the heart of the passage. Husbands are intended to be, now hear this, faithful. Faithful caretakers or stewards of their wives. Faithful caretakers or stewards of their wives. Wives are the loving compliments to their husbands, and vice versa. The term describes a voluntary offering of oneself to another in, get this, willing support. It reflects the heart of whom of Jesus himself, who though he was equal to God, willingly subjected himself to the Father in, in Philippians 2 and came to earth so that we might have life and have it to the fullest. Practically speaking, it means that wives should love their husbands with heartfelt respect and admiration in ways that honor, lift up, and meet their needs. Let's talk about the practical sense. How many of you know that, that, that husband and wives are just different? Right? Right? There are, there, there are many, many different books written on the, 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 a, a book that, that's transformational in Kristen and I's marriage was a book called Love and Respect. Love and Respect. I forget who wrote it. It was that transformational. I'm just blanking on it right now. I should have wrote it down. I thought I would remember it because it it's a good one. But Love and Respect, right? And a phenomenal book. And, and, and it talks about how men and women receive love differently. Don't put me in a category. You're going to just struggle. Okay. Men receive love in honor. Right? If you, for the most part, second guess, doubt, right? Driving in the car. Man knows where to go. Are you sure? Is he feeling love in that moment? No! Right? No! Men feel most loved when they're trusted, right? That's how they receive it. And so, and so Paul, the, uh, not, to, not to tell Paul how to use, do his job, but this is what the word, the, the term here, submit, literally means if you go and study the Greek of submit here, it's to honor. It's to honor. It's to build up. And so, and so wives should respectively lift, respectfully lift up, build up their honor. Husbands, okay? And so practically speaking, it's how we receive love is, why, is the reason. Historically speaking, it's because, it's because what did Paul write most about to the churches? False teaching. Okay? And so the historical context here, and this is especially true in the church in Ephesus, because Ephesus even took it so far as they built a, they built a statue, they built a monument of a, of, a, of a female god in the center of Ephesus. And so when Paul writes to the church at Ephesus and tells them, you know, similarly, wives submit to your husbands, he's trying to bring back the order that God created in the family, the family order that it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve because culturally they were being so misguided, misled away from Jesus by these false teachings. By these false teachings. Okay? Now, here's what you need to know. Okay? Here's what you need to know before we go any further. And I'm not going to spend this much time um, elsewhere, hopefully. Women. Sisters. The church needs you. The church is desperately dependent on you. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what would happen today without you? There's a movement right now in India 
that is a church planting movement. And because of the culture over there, it is completely being led, run, pastored by women. There is nothing about that that displeases the heart of God. Nothing. Nothing. And so don't read a verse, wives submit, and think God is picking on you. Believe God is calling you uniquely in language that might be uncomfortable to you, but again, don't, don't misinterpret it or misunderstand it, to flourish in the role that He's designed you for. To flourish in the place where He has you. It's not dependent, this honoring, the submission, it's not dependent on the husband's faithfulness to fulfill his role either. That's huge. It's not dependent on the husband's faithfulness to fulfill his role, although it doesn't obligate a bride to follow immoral or legal behavior or subject herself to harm by any means. But we're going to get to kids in just a minute, right? Have you parented perfectly, parents? But your kids are still called to follow you, aren't they? In the same way that no one in here is a perfect husband. No one in here is a perfect wife. But we're still called to the best of our ability and whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. Husbands should sacrificially love their wives. Look at verse 19. Husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. The role of the husband perfectly complements the bride and includes a twofold command. Right? It's almost like God's in control of this. The husband's love for his wife should be characterized as sacrificial and selfless. It's compared to Jesus so much because, again, Jesus... My message just disappeared. Um, okay, there it is. Right? So much of Jesus' uh, uh, love, all of Jesus' love for us is sacrificial and serving, selfless, setting aside his own needs, his own wants, his own desires for the sake of the one he marries, and so much setting aside his own wants, needs, and desires for the sake of us, he went to the cross. Now, husbands, Love for his wife comes from, get this, a passion for Jesus and his devotion to Jesus. As a result, similarly to wives, because these go so hand in hand, that's why I'm not going to spend as much time here as I did in the beginning. Uh, as a result, it's not dependent on character or conduct either. Our wives <clears throat> are a gift from God. Aren't they husbands? A gift from God. A gift from God that He entrusts us to care for, to cherish, to protect, and to provide for. A gift from God. Nope. Not going to go there. They're a gift from God. Okay, children and parents. Let's talk about them for a minute. Okay, how many of you have ever been a child of a parent? Okay, very good. How many of you are your parents in the room? Uncomfortable, isn't it? My mama's right here. Okay, my mama's the best mama I've ever had. The best one I've ever had. All right. Um, verse 20. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Now, again, that word fathers there, that includes the mother as well. Okay, a lot of times, like in Scripture, when Jesus fed the 5,000, I don't know why this is so, it's, it's very culturally driven, right? But Jesus fed the 5,000, they didn't count the women and children, so it was probably more like 13,000. Well, why did they do that? I don't know. 
Okay, it's, it's, it, was culturally, it was culturally driven. Again, it doesn't mean that you're less than or anything like that, but when you see fathers there, it's fathers and mothers do not provoke. Okay? Okay, that's huge. Your children, lest they become discouraged. So children should humbly listen to their parents. Okay? Now, this term here, get this. Okay? So if anybody should be offended in the room, it should be the kids. Okay? Because this term here is used stronger than the term submission that Paul used previously. Okay? So, 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 so wives, again, right? The honor piece here, Paul uses a term stronger in submission with the children than he did with wives. Children have an unqualified responsibility, an unqualified responsibility to comply with the instruction and guidance of their parents in everything, in everything, right? Why can't I do this? Because I said so. It's perfectly acceptable. It's perfectly acceptable. Right now, if you want a a true relationship, that I, I I believe you should probably explain sometime, explain yourself at some point. Right, you may not be able to in the moment. Right, because I said so, may have to fly for a little bit. You can't be in the middle. Right, we were at the we were at the Grand Canyon one time, and we experienced the like a huge hailstorm, huge thunderstorm, and and my kid, a couple of my kids are a lot like me. Yikes. Right? And they wanted to get as close to the hail as humanly possible. And I'm like, back up. Why? I want to see the storm. Because I said so. Why? Because I said so. We don't have time in the midst of this hailstorm for me to explain this to you. Get back here undercover and we'll talk about it later. Later, conversation comes up. Do you know why I wanted you to back up in that hailstorm? Why, Daddy? Because that could have killed you. <laughs> right? I mean, sometimes in the moment, because I said so, is enough and should be enough biblically because there's an unqualified responsibility for children to respond and submit in submission to their parents. Honor your father and mother. The underlying premise of respect and admiration reveals the intended motivation and disposition of the heart that should characterize the children's compliance to their parents. Now, here's the deal. Mom, dad... Huge reason to pray for your kid's salvation. Because remember, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do all to the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. It is hard for me to please God as a child if I'm not pursuing Him. In moments of rebellion... In moments of rebellion, in my moments of rebellion, right... My brother, Andy, getting, getting frustrated because he knows. Right? In moments of rebellion, it's hard to be a good son. In moments of rebellion, it's hard to be a good daughter. Because you're not pursuing Jesus. Right? And, and, so, and so, do all to the name of the Lord Jesus. A heart of honor does not determine obedience based on the parent's merit or performance, and it doesn't resent obedience out of obligation. It shows a humble deference to parents and acknowledgement of whose authority? God's authority. So let me ask you something. When it comes to parenting, right, let's talk about the parents and the kids for a moment, and then we'll, then we'll harp on the parents. As, but as we're transitioning here, let me just ask you something. Have you ever considered that you're doing it wrong? Kids don't. Right? They don't know better. I mean, listen, I say this as, as, a, as a kid. Again, I've got a mother in the room. Right? I, I say this as a father of four. I say this as a, as a youth pastor, former youth pastor. Right? I say this. Right? Kids don't consider another option that they're doing it wrong. Right? Let me ask you something, parent. In your authority... As a parent, in your authority as a mom, dad, have you ever considered you're doing it wrong? Have you ever considered you're doing it wrong? Can I, can I, can I be honest with you? Like, this is a journey I'm on. This is a journey I'm on, okay? So, so please don't take this as any judgment, okay? Please don't take this as any judgment. Maybe we're causing more anxiety in our kids be, because we're giving them cell phones earlier. Maybe. Like, let's just consider that for a moment. Maybe we're doing it wrong. And, and listen, two of my kids have cell phones, two of them have iPods. And so I'm a hypocrite up here. But I'm just saying, right? 
which is true every Sunday, by the way. Don't take this wives, husbands, parents, children, leaders, believers uh, 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 message today as I've got all six of these areas figured out. I don't. I don't. But as a parent, as a child, humility has to rule the relationship. I would say that as husbands, wives too. As a, as a husband, have you ever considered you're doing it wrong? As a wife, have you ever considered you're doing it wrong? Right? That is a place I believe that as we humbly submit and surrender ourselves to Jesus first, right? Humility rules the day. Have you ever considered you're doing it wrong? Okay? And so, so children, oh my goodness, I cannot believe what time it is. That's why everybody's leaving. It has nothing to do with the message. Whew! Okay. Parents should faithfully lead their children. Let's talk about this real quick. By defining the relationship of the children and the father, Paul is ultimately emphasizing their submission to their loving Heavenly Father. Again, this does not negate or minimize the significance of the mother. In fact, his use of the paternal term is inclusive and intended to address fathers and mothers. Like I said earlier, the home was designed by God to cultivate hearts that love Jesus and live for Him in order to produce a godly heritage of Christ's followers. We're married for the mission. We are married for the mission. We parent for the mission of Jesus. What's the mission of Jesus? Like Russ was saying, go make disciples of all nations. Go make disciples of all nations. Right? Worry less. Worry less. And I'm saying this to myself. Worry less. I wish my kids were in here to hear this, but two of them are serving and two of them are in children's ministry. Right? I worry less about their clean room. Worry more about their prayer life. Amen. Worry less. Worry less about the clutter that they leave behind. Oh my word, it wears and grinds on me as a parent. But worry more about their pursuit of Jesus. Not are they here because they're the pastor's kid, but are they here because they want to be here in the house of God and hear about Him and learn how to worship Him and grow in Him and serve the body of Christ like two of them are doing right now and they do it so beautifully, willingly, and lovingly. Way more than I do. Because when I see their names on the list of server there, I'm like, bummer, they're not going to hear Daddy preach. And they're like, yay, we don't want to hear Daddy preach. <laughs> oh no, one's right here. <laughs> You're not over there. I thought you were over there. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Forget what I said about serving willing, lovingly, and all those things. Right? But worry less about the things that you see right in front of you. Worry more about are they pursuing Jesus, mom and dad. Believers and leaders, let's hit this. Okay, verses 22 through 25. I pray this is connected some level. 22 through 4, 1. Okay, bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, here it is again, referencing back to verse 17, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving Jesus. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong that he has done. There's no partiality. Masters, you know, you know what that means? God, God's going to fight the battle. And he's not going to do it. He's not going to do it with favoritism. There's no partiality. God's going to fight the battle. If you've been wronged as a servant in your job, if you've been wronged at your workplace, I know some of you have been wronged by your workplace, right? And, there, and you've battled some resentment. You've battled some unforgiveness. You've battled some hurt from that, right? Some potential bitterness, right? God's going to deal with those people that wronged you. God's going to deal with those people that wronged you, Okay? Okay? With no partiality. Masters, treat your bond service justly, fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, to kind of quick the, uh, quicken the process, I, I, I defined this relationship as believers and leaders. Because again, all of us, all of us, say it again with me, all, okay, all of us are called to be servants. Okay, all of us. 
All of us are called to be servants. Jesus pursued people to serve them, to wash their feet, ugh, right? To, 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 to provide for them, to, to serve them. And we've said it here before. We're never more like Jesus than when we serve. And so each and every one of us in the room are called in some way, shape, or form to be a servant to the authority that, again, God has placed ahead of us. God has placed above us. I can't blame anybody but God. Right? That God has placed there. Why? No clue. But it's there. Right? And so each one of us is a servant. But before we go any further, it's important to know that Paul was certainly not advocating slavery here. That's what some people say. Some have misunderstood his failure to condemn the institution or his refusal to endorse rebellion against it is an implicit re- endorsement. But Scripture is clear that discrimination of any kind, because you've got to you put the whole text together, the discrimination of any kind, social, political, racial, any humane in treatment of others is ungodly and therefore unacceptable. Paul's instructions for slaves and masters change the perspective of their respective positions, focusing on their roles and responsibilities as service to the Lord. So when you go to work tomorrow morning, it's as service to the Lord. When you go to work tonight, it's as service to the Lord. And He can take the moments when you don't feel like working. When you don't feel like loving. When you don't feel like smiling. Pastor, did you see the way they treated me? Yep. Do it as unto the Lord. 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 His instructions to servants focused on their willing compliance. Obey your human masters in everything with the assurance that your service would be rewarded by Jesus. Leaders, be fair and just. Masters, treat your bondservants justly, fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Masters or leaders are directed to work with integrity, not only while being watched, but to serve with sincerity, not simply as people pleasers, to labor diligently, wholeheartedly, fearing the Lord. Let me tell you what we should have done. We should have taken a week on each of these relationships. Regardless of our circumstances, write this down. Everything we do in our homes, in our churches, in our places of work should be done for the honor of Jesus as we diligently labor for our Master. Don't get distracted by the words He uses. Pursue the heart behind what He's trying to get at. Love Jesus. As a wife, as a husband, as a child, as a parent, as a worker, as a leader. Love and pursue Jesus. So there's two things I want us to do. The worship team is going to come. Because we're going to close with this. In kindness and understanding, therefore, because of everything we've heard, And again, so much more to unpack here. But leave your bag at the altar for a few more minutes. Don't pick it back up yet. Okay, don't pick it back up yet. Two things that we've got to do in all of this. Husbands, wives, parents, children, believers, leaders. Okay, each each one of us fit in at least one of those categories. Each one of us fit in at least one of those categories. Number one, consider carefully different situations. Consider carefully different situations. As you you leave this place, as you pick that back, back, back up, right? I pray that this morning you will look at the people around you. You will look at the people in your house with eyes of grace that you haven't before. That you haven't before. That you will carefully consider, right? That, 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 that each one of us has had a different upbringing. A different upbringing. 
Uh, Kristen and I were talking about this Friday night as we were driving home from Boston. She came and picked me up from the airport. We were driving home and we were just talking about how culturally different it is to be a husband and wife in, in North Carolina and Tennessee as it is in Maine. I grew up in a different situation. I saw different things, right? And they just do it wrong down there. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But consider different situations. And don't, don't get angry and upset when you see something that, that, that doesn't sit right, just right with you because you grew up in a different situation. Right? Because every husband and wife is different. They've got to figure out what submission and love looks like for them. Okay? Consider different situations when it comes to parenting. Because if you know one child, you know one child. Right? And so the way I parent my four kids may not be the way, way that you parent your eight. Right? Or your two. Right? But consider different situations. Consider different ways of doing things so that we can love each other as Christ loved the church. Number two, prayerfully consider different seasons. How many of you know that different seasons call for different actions? Different seasons call for different actions. Different seasons call for different actions. Now, what you can't do, family, is wish away the season you're in. Don't wish away the season you're in. As chaotic, as stressful, as, as, as overwhelming, as burdening, as frustrating, as angering, as disappointing, as whatever it may be for you. Don't wish away the season you're in. Oh, what I would do to change a diaper again. I mean it. I loved it. I loved just holding them when they couldn't move. Right? And they couldn't, they couldn't run away from me. I had them. I loved holding my babies. Man, loved it. I loved it. And part of my disappointment now is they look for opportunities to get away from me <laughs> instead of closer to me. I've got one getting her license in like four months. She's never going to see me again. Don't wish away the season you're in, but do consider different seasons prayerfully. The worst thing we can do, I believe, is judge one another in the season they're in. Instead of loving through it. Instead of loving through it. Last thing, and consider this in all six relationships. I shared this this past week and um, with my group of pastors. Can I tell you something? Just be real and vulnerable for you for a minute, with you for a minute. Thank you for the permission. I, I promise this is the last thing we'll say. I know I'm way over. Be happy. <laughs> I'm so glad because we had two kids at the beginning of our marriage, 20 months apart or so. Then we thought we were done, took like five years off, then had two more kids about 21 months apart. And I'm so glad for the second two. Because God gave me a second chance to be a decent father. Because for the first two or three years of Bria and Micah's life, I was a crappy father. I had priorities out of whack. All I cared about was ministry, growing a student ministry. I had a pastor that didn't let me have a Sunday off after both of them were born. I didn't get time at home. And there are times where I will look at them and just, man, wish I could go back and love Bria and Micah as a baby. 
in their first three years. Right. But I can't, and I'm thankful that I can't, and here's why. Because I was such a crappy father then, God showed me how to be a good father now. Because of the time where I was the worst husband in the room, 2010 to 2023. <laughs> because I was the worst husband in the room, there ain't nobody in this room that loves their wife more than I love this woman over here in the pink sweater that she spilled something on this morning. <laughs> nobody. Nobody. But I had to go to that place so that God could show me the deficiencies in me so that I could be good. And it all had to do and I was in ministry. I was a pastor, y'all. People were meeting Jesus under my ministry. God was using what I thought was, was the perfect version of me. My ministry's growing. My ministry's growing. Why can't you just, just see this and get on board with the fact that this is the way it is? Oh my word, the things I used to say. But when I started pursuing Jesus and cared more about loving my family than loving my church. Everything changed. The point that Paul is getting after here, pursue Jesus more than you pursue your wife. Pursue Jesus more than you pursue your husband. Pursue Jesus more than you pursue your kids. Pursue Jesus more than you obey your parents. Pursue Jesus more than, than, than being a slave to your job. Pursue Jesus more than pursuing being a boss or a leader, and you will please God and honor others. That's the heart of this passage. It's easy to get distracted by the words. Don't miss the meaning. Pursue Jesus. Pursue Jesus. Pursue Jesus. Father, today, I pray for the one that's in a season of hurt, anger, bitterness, and one of these relationships. And I just pray for freedom there. God, we're about to sing, I surrender all. I pray that we surrender ourselves in the relationships that we're in. And God, as we prayed at the front end, we need you. We pray even more at the back end. Whatever we do, in word or deed, do all to the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father, you by Him. And so God, help us to surrender ourselves to you and show us how to be husbands, fathers, wives, mothers, children, Believers and leaders. That do well for you. In Jesus name I pray. Amen.